Uh, can I get roll call, please? Chairman Waggy? Here. <clears throat> Alderman Tice? Here. Alderman Gould? Here. Alderman Shelton? Here. All members are present. Great. Uh, we'll move on to agenda approval. Any amendments to the agenda? Seeing none. Okay, we'll move in the citizen comment. Any citizens wish to address the board online or here? No one online. Okay. Uh, we'll go to the reports of committee chair and alderman. Uh, I have nothing to report. Uh, Nancy? No report. Jeff? Yeah. No report. Jack? No report. Okay. I'm rolling. Uh, no city administrator report. Moving to department reports, public works. Yes, I turned it off. Good evening. Um, I have just a few brief uh, items to update you on. So the first so one is the MSD, MSD sewer MSD. improvements for Rosalie White Bridgeport. Fred Luth, as you're aware, they're still working on White Avenue. Um, you know, the, the previous special board meeting, the time extension was rejected. They had originally asked for a time extension through June 10th. That was rejected. Uh, they just continue to do the work without it. And when I talked to Evan this morning, he said that they're just trying to finish up uh, White, and then they'll skip over to Rosalie. And then if you go out there, you'll see there's a manhole sitting on the south side. They want to get that pipe connected, then those two streets will be done, then they'll go to Bridgeport. They don't want to tear up Bridgeport until the other two are completed. And that makes sense. And then essentially whenever all these um, streets are done with their sewer mains, then they'll have a subcontractor come in and do the paving. So in case anyone asks, paving's still off probably at least another month, maybe two. You know, I'm thinking July, August. Um, Next job, or next project, I should say, the access ramp, curb cut at Lee Wind Trail near that intersection of Rosalie and Eulalie. It's still on our radar. We just haven't done anything with it because we're working over on Yorkshire Lane Court. So there's several slabs, both on the East Fork and West Fork, you know, that comes off of Park Ridge that we're doing. Those slabs are, I think, original, so they're probably 20 plus years old. And some of them were fractured enough that there's a vertical gap of at least an inch, which would be a trip hazard. So. We'll get those done probably this week, if not, then next week. I know there was a pour today, and I believe there's another one. Mary Kay Court, another one of those for just uh, housekeeping, you know, putting it on there. Whenever we get time doing the other projects, then we'll try to do something with that cul-de-sac for the test area of uh, GeoGrid. The uh, stormwater report, the only thing to report there is that Gonzalez is uh, putting together their presentation for the next uh, month's meeting. So the July 14th Public Works Committee, they'll go over a presentation with the 48 project areas that are of concern, the costs, and then the ranking of those. And then Route 100 Manchester Road improvements, um, pretty much the same as last month. You know, pedestrian tunnel they're working on, the bridge, you know, is totally gone and they're working on the new bridge. The newest um, update would be that starting around June 20th, eastbound Manchester Road going east of Hanley Road would be closed. That's to do this, uh, or there's some MSD work that's near that intersection. So since there's way less traffic than normal, um, KCI said that MSD is directing them to do that little corner there. But <clears throat> you know, I said, well, as long as you notify Metro and others, because I know there's the Metrolink station there in Maplewood, and I don't know how the buses circumnavigate around all these different areas that are closed. And then uh, the next one would be York Village Streetlight Improvements. We've marked everything up there as far as utilities, uh, staked the locations, talked to the two private property owners. The third location is MoDOT owned, so MoDOT's fine with putting the light in. And then TWM's actually preparing the easement description. So as soon as I have those, which I'm expecting next week, I'll give those to the private owners have those signed off on and then we'll try to work those in. So that would be for those three lights. And we have the lights, wiring, batteries, everything sitting back at the shop. It's just a matter of putting the foundations in. And we want to do all three at the same time. It's like just rent the auger, put those three in, let it cure, then come in next week, pop them on there, and then we're done. And then the last thing, which you'll see later on in the agenda, is the uh, 2022 street RFP. So we'll go over that under new business. That's it. <clears throat> On the um, Bridgeport work, uh, has has Luth looked at the turnaround on uh, that that's at the end of Bridgeport and made right. made an assessment that their they trucks that should work. can yeah. make that work? Yeah, they okay. said because of the flare of that cul-de-sac <coughs> radius, they can actually kick a, a 
they're going to ask for people not to park, obviously, right. on the street. That's what I was going to say. They should be able to swing and do a multi-point turnaround and come back out. Okay. So no access road there. And then um, can you give an update on the two, two places that have some uh, – one one you may not be able to speak to because it might not be our uh, under our control, but the the – little sinkhole that's in Joseph and uh, Dorothy. Yeah, um, yeah. There's there's kind of a hole there, and mm -hmm. you know, um, so I'd like to un understand. I know <coughs> residents have asked me about that um, in the area. And then the exit going um, uh, northeast onto Strassner, there's, there's that seepage water that's coming out there. Is that from a utility, or is that just groundwater? Right, I'll skip back to the first, or yeah, I'll just answer the last one first. Uh, the seepage that's there is actually from sewer. So a sample was taken okay. by St. Louis County DOT. They ran it to a lab, said that it tested positive for fecal coliform and a bunch right. of other stuff. So they know it's wastewater. Where it's coming from, they thought was 2010 South Brentwood Boulevard, which would be a home that's maybe two or three doors south of Lawn, the dead end of Lawn, on the east side of Brentwood Boulevard. Okay. Now, when the person at 2010 paid a plumber to TV it, they said that it's connected. When MSD went out there, they said it wasn't connected. So right now we're trying to figure out whose video is correct or if maybe there's two different pipes that are for the same address. You know, maybe one of them got abandoned, but it wasn't abandoned correctly. Maybe it just dead ends and waste is just hmm. seeping in there because it is at a higher elevation than where it's pooling and where it's you know, deteriorated the uh, pavement. Okay. So it is the county's road, but the county won't fix it until the sewer issue's fixed. But they did at least fill it in. I called them. I wanted it plated, but they filled in the hole, and I'm like, well, that's temporary. It's just going to eventually saturate and sink again. But if it sinks a little bit more, we'll just call it in again and just keep doing it. Okay. And then the Joseph. And then the Joseph one, we've called that in twice to MSD because we think it's a sewer leak. Because if you follow the path, you'll see right. that there's sewer right there. And then there's also a depression that's on Joseph itself. So there's the one that's in Dorothy near Joseph, and then slightly east of Dorothy in Joseph is another area that we marked with white paint. So we don't have an update on it. They're supposed to go out there and die test it, but typically once they do that, they'll send a letter to public works, and we don't have one. Yet. Okay. But Thank it is you. on their radar. Any other questions for Dan? Great, thanks, Dan. Thanks. All right, Parks and Rec. All right, uh, good evening. We're going to start tonight with our presentation from SWT about the new uh, design for the Hanley, Co Comfort, Hanley Park Comfort Station. Pops up here. Always test this before the meeting. Kelly, you're my witness. Ready to share. Sorry. Ready to do dramatic interpretation of it? I have to make up for the start then. Connecting to base unit.
really pretty. <laughs> Not connect. Move that gold one. Yeah. we test it out beforehand yes uh, we had it up there just yeah. for this reason should have left it up there we have witnesses eric we saw it it was switched on I'm sorry. I'll give you the first couple of slides as I try to figure this out. So uh, we started this project, this is a master plan project. So we started looking at the Hanley Park Pavilion, obviously when we did the master plan in 2014. And during the master plan process, a couple things were pretty evident uh, from the people who showed up is the biggest issues in, in Hanley Park were uh, the, the restrooms, uh, which aren't ADA accessible and honestly had been uh, run down a little bit. And then secondarily, uh, parking. Just with most of the parks, there's just not enough parking. So the master plan uh, envisioned a combined pavilion and restroom and that would allow expansion of the parking lot. And so that's kind of what we worked on in the master plan. We've moved forward. Uh, last October, uh, the board approved the um, contract with SWT to do the design, and we are here hopefully to talk about that design. I can put it in board docs real quick. I'm doing the IT thing of rebooting your computer. <laughs> that always works. on my desktop right now. Okay, I'm putting it in four docs real quick, Paul.
This better be the best presentation ever. <laughs> Again, no pressure, Ted. It's, it's loading right now, Paul. All I have to do is refresh. Then the uh, Parks and Rec Department report. Refresh. Bola shares it. We won't be able to see it. So the first screen, uh, so, okay, so the second screen, if you guys can pull it up, the project context screen, that's kind of what I was just talking about. And so uh, the, the kind of the whole park view, as you know, we kind of started with the... Um, Is that it? Technology is great. Uh, we start with the uh, sand volleyball courts and the basketball court and pickleball courts. Uh, so uh, Ted and Scott behind me from SWT had kind of come in and have done the 75% completion in late January. And you know it, it requires a lot of permitting. So we've been working with MSD, the US Army Corps of Engineers, FEMA, all those things because again, things that we used to be able to do 20 years ago, MSD and the Corps really care about now. So. We have to make sure we're following all those good regulations. So this is just kind of a quick slide to show kind of what the existing conditions look like. Uh, again, you see uh, lights, or yeah, sorry, well, I'll keep telling you when to turn. Uh, so you see the, the parking lot is, you know, just kind of a, a two-bay uh, two system. Uh, you can get probably close to 20 cars. Uh, we have the, the trail and volleyball courts. Uh, the volleyball washing area has become a, a, an issue because obviously people want to wash off after volleyballs. And we've had a, a good, good attendance in our league. So uh, the existing pavilion is really kind of falling apart. The roof is kind of dropping apart. Um, and, you know, beyond that, it's, it's one of those, you know, the 90s pavilions that we put in. And you kind of see everything else. So the interior of the restrooms, it kind of shows you where we don't have the width for ADA accessibility. So that's kind of where we're at to begin with. I went the wrong way. So if we go to uh, slide four, Bola, I'm gonna turn it over to Ted. Great. Things go wrong. Great. So yeah, I think as Eric ex explained, the, uh, the parking is a dead end parking. It's just one bay of parking. So that was certainly problematic. And as you know, the function of the there's a separate pavilion and a separate bathroom. And so we really took into account how could we make this kind of a unified uh, park experience? Uh, how could we build upon the, the Oak Tree Park Pavilion and, and uh, Comfort Station that's kind of combined together so that we kind of you know, bring up the park as a, as a full system? Um, one of the other things that we really wanted to look at, really I, I was kind of excited about being on a creek. I love creeks, right? I think. So often we've turned our backs on, on tr creeks, but as a kid, that's where I played. I, I, I would be in that creek in a heartbeat if I lived near this creek. Uh, and, and it's just this undiscovered kind of unwanted area. Uh, but I think now we're looking at a way to like, rather than turning our back on the creek, let's make that creek part of the engagement of, of the park itself. Um, so we really also were looking at how does this serve uh, both the, uh, the, the multi-purpose court, the sand volleyball court, we have the trail coming through here. It really becomes an important knuckle to really think through. Uh, Paul, I'm gonna move to the next slide. Arrow keys, Harry, yeah. down. Here we go. Uh, so you should see the site plan, yeah, the color site plan. So what we did was simply made a two-bay parking lot. Uh, we're able to do that by removing the pavilion uh, that's there. So as we, the, the uh, bay of parking to the uh, west was added, uh, or I'm sorry, to the east was, no, to the west was added. And that allowed for much better circulation movement, allows for ADA parking uh, right nearby. And then you could see with that kind of that teal blue color on both both sides of the parking that's where we're doing our our bmps prior going into the creek so all of our stormwater capture uh, is in this location 
Uh, and then we're able to uh, do a combined, and you'll see some three-dimensional studies on this. Uh, we're able to combine the comfort station uh, and the storage space, which again is uh, needed by staff over here. It'd be helpful to have. And then much like Oak Tree, we have kind of the open pavilion uh, towards the creek uh, that's covered, and then it kind of vis visually engages that area. And so we've made some improvements to that. I think we kind of critiqued what was out there and what was built, and there's nothing like having the prototype built, and how can we better improve on that uh, was great. And, and what this does is it becomes kind of a two-sided pavilion. We have the one side uh, to the south, which could be the rental portion, uh, and then the side immediately to the west that engages the sand volleyball and overlooks that space. And so we feel like we're getting like a, you know, a double and triple entendre out of, of being able to do it this way. Um, I'm trying to get those other features here. Uh, you'll see that uh, we've mentioned a little bit about the sand volleyball engaging that edge. We have a foot washing station that's on the other side of a seat wall here. Uh, the seat wall is kind of what separates the volleyball play area. You can sit and watch volleyball from the, the paved surface. Because, you know, we are going to be worried about dragging sand. We talked a lot to staff about maintenance and how that, that might work. Uh, we have a bicycle parking area immediately to the north of that entrance from where the sand volleyball is going. I'm sorry, I can't point. Um, and then that just allows kind of that to function as a sand volleyball zone. And then we have that separate zone towards Black Creek uh, to facilitate that. Then the doors of the comfort station all face to the north, which is good. So we have eyes on the doors, which I think is important. Um, so the, those, the comfort station's been designed to be uh, basically two family restrooms. Uh, so they're gender neutral a, as a result of that. Uh, and then I'll get in more into the floor plan here, but then that allows for good storage and kind of a, what I call a blank wall to the south that helps that kind of function with the uh, pavilion and the um, picnic tables that you see there. Go to the next slide. Uh, the next slide is basically again showing that existing conditions. Uh, we wanted you to see this kind of in context with how it works today. Um, and then the next slide shows how that three-dimensional model builds over the top of that. So uh, it really creates that knuckle point uh, between the sand volleyball and the parking. And then to be able to have that connectivity visually to the creek, I think, is, uh, is kind of an extra added bonus as we think about that. Next slide, uh, we looked at uh, some sustainable uh, features here. Uh, certainly, I think being true to what MSD requires of us, but let's, I always like taking lemons and making lemonades out of it, as you know. Uh, I just see those as something that is part of the, the, the educational message and being next to a creek, it's a real good way to uh, uh, enjoy that and, and see that right nearby. Uh, maybe we can do some educational signage there, that would be nice to do. Uh, our plant palette is primarily natives. Uh, we have uh, adaptable plants here to uh, work well in this park and create more biodiversity. Uh, we did, uh, we were interested in looking at the solar powered parking lot lighting here. Uh, that's a good place if we're gonna do solar. That's where there's the least amount of shade. Uh, and when we did look at the idea of doing solar on the comfort station, because we're so close to that kind of tree lined edge of the creek, that's our south solar exposure. We didn't feel like we could get the value uh, out of that. So we talked to our uh, mechanical engineering consultant uh, with Ross and Berezini, and they felt that there just wouldn't be a very good payoff on doing that. The next slide is giving you a little bit better understanding of the floor plan. Uh, with north being up, you can see we have the, the two doors that enter the general neutral uh, uh, bathrooms or the family restrooms. And then at the middle of that outside wall, you can see that's where we have our drinking fountains. And again, so if people are on the path, it's a clear visual cue, right? We can, we can see where the fountains are, you can fill up your bottle, and uh, it's, it's a good quick shot from the sand volleyball as, uh, as well. So I think that's a real nice accommodation. And then what that allows us to do is uh, we have a mechanical room to the east side. It's, uh, we don't need much room there. We are going to heat the, 
the, the restroom so you don't have to winterize it. That, it. You could keep it open during the what I call the shoulder seasons of the park. Uh, the porcelain might, or the steel or the porcelain might be a little cold, uh, but it still will be functional if uh, you choose to do so. And then the storage area is just something that we've heard uh, uh, with the programming staff at the sand volleyball be really handy to have um, uh, some additional storage over there. Uh, and I think we have a slop sink in there too. And then the southern wall, where I said it's kind of this blank wall, what we want to do there is do like a servery counter there. Uh, we talked a lot about, well, do we do a sink out there? Then we started going, well, everybody's pork and beans is going to be in that sink. It's going to get clogged. It's going to be a mess. So we thought just having a nice uh, serving counter there and some plug outlets would be a real nice feature for the folks that might be having a little family gathering out there and have like a little servery out there. Uh, what works out really well. So we're, we're excited about making these little uh, finesse uh, improvements. And then you can see uh, to the left of the slide there how that covered patio kind of uh, pavilion comes out. And then we actually extend that terrace a little bit further out because I want that to be a beautiful gesture as you're looking out uh, towards the creek. These are the building elevations. Uh, I'm going to go into detail here, but we're again looking very similar to uh, what uh, was built at Oak Tree, where we use uh, masonry. We have a base course of masonry, uh, and then we have another course of, of brick up above it uh, to give it that, that nice look. And then the other thing, what I didn't like about Oak Tree uh, is I, I don't like having that ceiling. It, it seems very, it feels low and a little bit more enclosed. So we're looking at more of an open vaulted ceiling in there to make it feel a little bit more gracious and then that gable looks out towards Black Creek. Uh, materials, we're still refining it. We have a couple of different options. Obviously, we're looking at standing seam metal roof. Uh, we are looking at the, the, the windows and the metal uh, that's going with that. I don't think we're like totally finished on this selection. Uh, but we feel very comfortable that the materials that we're picking are very resilient and, and tough for the park environment, but still look, look nice. Giving you a little bit more 3D perspectives, this gives you a little bit better idea of that seat wall that I was telling you about that separates the sand volleyball from kind of the, the, the immediate seating area. You can see the, I'm sorry, did you get next? Yeah, slide, oh, sorry. We should have given you a heads up on, oh, you're following me? All right, right on. Uh, you can see where we have the bicycle parking, so immediately off the trail there, that becomes our ADA walk up to the pavilion. One of the things that we had to do was make sure that we were out of that 100-year that flood zone, so it still is built up, so we're able to get the ADA accessibility by, by uh, reworking the uh, trail and the walkway leading to that, and we're staying underneath 5%, which allows us to not have to use grasping rails and all that. Uh, but you can see there's a bike corral, there's that washing, that foot washing area, the seat wall, that, and then the two extra, uh, you know, picnic tables that look over that. So we, we like the idea that, that this uh, has that duality there. Then coming from the parking lot, again, this is where our accessible walkway is. What the first two stalls on either side of that walk uh, would, would be ADA, and that would take you right up to that pavilion level. And you can see on the other side overlooking uh, Black Creek, we have that nice little prow. It's only 18 inches, 18 to 24 inches high in that area, so we don't need a guardrail there. It's just meant to be just a lovely prow that, that looks over uh, the creek in that location. Um, and then we you can kind of see into the, the shade structure of the pavilion where there's that counter that I talked about. And, and, and the, the seating arrangement, how we might see that working out. On the next one, just another view, you, can, you see the, uh, the door to the uh, storage room. Uh, you can see up high, I didn't mention, that, but there's, there's uh, glass up there to help get some daylighting into the, the restrooms. That, that, that is something I think is worthwhile to do. Uh, you can see where we have the grill there. I think we're going to either re repurpose the grill that we already have there. It's in pretty good shape. So the idea is it's just kind of a big community grill at that location. Uh, on to the next one, you can see how the 
uh, the trail interfaces. We want to make sure that we have a safe crossing there with the cars coming in and out and the access along the trail uh, works out very, very well. Next shot is just again, just showing you a little bit further view, uh, looking back to the south and east there. And then the, the next one is we're getting into the uh, costing. So one of the things uh, as uh, Eric and his team and my team got into this is it became very clear to us it's more than just a pavilion uh, or a comfort station. It's really multiple projects kind of bundled into this one knuckle that I was saying. And, and so what we did is we decided to, it's always hard to hit people with like one big number and not say, well, how does this break out? How does it break down? So we have been using, and we're doing our best in our cost opinions. We're, we're looking at bids that we've recently received. We're trying to, you know, make sure that we're true in the marketplace right now. As, as everybody knows, the marketplace is uh, uh, a bit uh, sketchy, and uh, we're, all, we're all getting out the tea leaves in our, our Ouija board. Um, but we feel pretty confident about that we've been conservative based on where we are right now uh, in the economy. Uh, the comfort station and pavilion itself, you can see, is that $550,000. That's, that's, you know, it's not crazy surprising. I would have said, you know, 10 years ago, I said it should be about $300,000. So I, I, I've seen that go from $300,000 to about where it is right now. Um, um, some of the work that we've been doing where we're doing resilient structures like this with masonry, that's um, n unfortunately not a big surprise to us as a design team. Uh, the parking lot addition, um, you can see it's coming in at $196,000, including the landscape and the curbs uh, to, to do all that and the removal and marrying it up to the new pavement. <coughs> the uh, trail uh, uh, realignment uh, is $40,000. And then the overall kind of landscape and lawn and plant material around the pavilion itself is coming in at $85,000, and that's uh, with the earthwork, I think, I believe as well, and the new pavement and the kind of the site work that's associated with that plaza for the uh, sand volleyball. And then the stormwater management and the BMPs is at 95,000. So we're a hair under a million dollars in all, the entire package, uh, but we thought it would be kind of better to break out how is this built up and you could tear it down and build it back up, but that's probably about where it's gonna end up no matter what. I think that's, I think that was the last slide. I can go back and forth and as much as we can and open it up to questions. Yeah, Jeff. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I appreciate all the thought that's gone into it. I think, um, you know, it's good to think about the stormwater management and, and all of that. Interesting about having the the sort of rental pavilion area look out onto the creek. I I, I, I tend to agree with you on let's let's uh, take advantage of the resources we have and clean them up and you know not ignore them. Um, the biggest question that I have is is really the parking lot and um, curious about your did you look at I noticed you have two two entrances, or I guess if one is an entrance, one's an exit. Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of pedestrians and bikers that yeah. use this path. And I, I know, you know, our family uses it all the time. In fact, my daughter always stops and does figure eights in, in that parking lot right now. It seems to me that having two places where cars could interact is, is really a bit concerning to me. And could we afford to lose four spaces in, you know, in there so that it's a, it, you still have two bays, but you, you have one entrance and one, you know, one place that it, they come in and go. So you don't have two places to cross. I think it's a great point, Jeff. I, you know, and we may not lose any depending on how we do it. We could, you know, we could probably, you know, shorten that bay down and do head in parking on that and just have that one you know, just one in and one out. What it does, it shortens that that mid rib, if you will, in order to do that. I think that's worth studying. Yeah. Because um, I, I like exactly where you're going with it. That's one less pedestrian conflict in per right. car. 
Yeah, I could, I could just. I'm not so sure I didn't think of that. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's no, I'm, that's the purpose of these meetings. So well, we should look at that. It might, it might even save on a curb cut and some, yeah. some yeah. dirt moving. <laughs> no. You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, I, so I, I like the concept of facing the, the creek. You know, I agree with you, you know, but have you been down there? You can't even tell that <laughs> well, there's a creek there. You know, I have. I mean, I, I think the thing, that's why I was like going, why aren't we opening this up? Because the thing that really draws me to it is really the rock matrix that's down there feels like a natural creek. It's like, I, you know, I live by River to Pear. There's nothing natural about that. It's all a concrete channel. Here it feel, still feels like, it's still the, a natural creek. It's just the, and, and I didn't even feel like there was that much garbage in there. What was garbage is all the honeysuckle and the, and and and, and just the neglect. But I, huh. I and one thing is, is that a lot of it, like you said, is a honeysuckle. And and we actually to kind of help Ted and his team out went and cleared out a lot of that during the winter. I and mean, we still have to treat it. We you know it takes years to eradicate it, but. Um, it, it is amazing you, the view you have once you clear out that honeysuckle. And the fact that you don't have residential immediately across from there is a bonus because I, I, I could see where that might have some cross conflict visually, but you don't have that. And so I, I think celebrate it. I mean, I, I'll go walk around behind the bathroom and take a look, but it just seems like you can't even tell there's a creek there oh. the way it is now because of the trees. It's not the honeysuckle per se. It's just, well, I mean, I've I've noticed a lot of the clearing when right by there, and it it does look great. I, in fact, I'll stop and look. I'm like, oh, that looks pretty good, you know, um, with the creek running. So I I do think there is something there. It would require some maintenance and cleanup because we would hate to have that overgrow again. Right. I mean, it just I, I the thing that stuck out to me was the fact that the pavilion part is on the back side of the building and the bathrooms are on the front. Right. I mean, uh, in my mind, it's like. People are looking for the birthday party they're going to, and they can't see anybody sitting at the picnic tables. And the, is this the right place? You know, and like, um, and then you know, I'm sure there will be concerns about, you know, we've kind of created a protected area that doesn't have visibility. You know, just like the the concern we had about the the path going behind the basketball courts and things, where you know bad things could be going on back there, and nobody would really be able to see. Um, it kind of creates a, and then also it seems like, you know, I've I've rented the current pavilion multiple times a year and you know and people kind of spill out onto the grass and so now you've got these kind of right disjointed places right so if everybody's sitting in their bag chairs out in the grass now and i'm cooking ribs back there then you know i don't know it's it, i don't know I, something I, doesn't seem right to me yeah i we talk a lot about that um and i think the you know, again, the safety and security. If you were to flip it around, well, then you got the you got the the doors of the restroom that are in hiding. Right. right. At least the open air pavilion, you do have three sides that, from angles, you can you can see back there, and we'll have lighting, you know, in there uh, as well. Um, I, I I would gather to say, and I I've done this in Forest Park and some other places. Uh, the the security on the bathroom side is probably trumps the the other side as far as the the terrace uh goes we did make it a little bit broader and bigger than you have at the oak tree park uh by extending it beyond the eave there so it does spill out a little bit more does it give you that that connection to the grass not quite as much i think part of that is we had to build it up you know the restroom itself needed to be built up out of that the, the hundred year flood plain there um, whereas today it's not, you know, the bathroom is, but the pavilion isn't. Yeah, Nancy. So I'm going to go back to this clearing along the park. Um, so, and I used to run over here a lot and I haven't been over there in a while, but is the whole area clearing it out or is this going to be like, we're going to clear it behind the pavilion but then it's going to overgrow from the park, you know, the path to the pool all the way to, uh, you know, beyond the, yeah, the other, you know, the two, the two uh, bridges. Yeah, I, I, in before you're on the the committee or uh, when Parker Tice, I had 
a presentation about parks and recreation and, and park maintenance in particular. And uh, one thing was taking care of honeysuckle. And I put up a map of Brentwood, and then I put up the same mat and said, this is where honeysuckle is in Brentwood. Uh, it is basically everywhere, and, and we started, I mean, we've started it, it in the natural area in Memorial Park, we started in the natural area in, in, in Oak Tree Park, and it is our goal to, you know, to get rid of the honeysuckle. We did this as kind of a case study for the design team to see how it would look and how it would fit in and how it would play with that creek, but yeah, our goal is to get rid of honeysuckle throughout all the parks and around the creeks. and. It, it will be a task and it will take a while. I can't promise it'll be done in a year, but it is something that's always on the forefront, especially during the winter time of the park maintenance. And I think that's something just park wide, just in all the municipalities I've worked in, you know, it's, um, there's grants that are available for that. There, it, it just, it's just something you just nip off a chunk at a time. And if, I mean, if some of you remember Kennedy Forest and, and successful forest, in Forest Park, those those were choked up, you know, miserable ecosystems, and uh, they've just recently wrapped up some major, you know, and and some of that's been a bio blitz or part of a bio blitz. It's been part of uh, volunteerism. I think I think it's something to rally behind and you know keep on doing it. But I, to your point, I I believe that 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 little uh, kind of test removal, just again, at least for me, confirmed that. It's nice to let these creeks and landscapes breathe a little. And then if I, one more question. So just to back to Brandon's comment about the, the flooding out, the people being able to extend beyond. Um, I'm just wondering if the plantings near the, um, near the barbecue grill, yeah. th that was a good, that was a good, go back. Yeah, Get that, that, yeah, that one there. Uh, yeah. we, we could. The, just like if right just those that. those few bushes could be removed and maybe they're just at the back and that's just it just opens to the grass but it just it's more open to the grassy area behind the um, sand volleyball they could stay on the east side just on the west side just it makes it a little yeah. more open no I think that would give it a little bit and, more and attaches it to the park too like there's a barrier at the parking lot and then but it, it's open to the park well, that area, particularly to the west side, for whatever reason, there's a lot of uh, runoff and moisture. It's a real wet area back over there. I don't know if we ever figured out exactly why, but um, it, it, I like the idea of flowing out on that east side more so than the... Maybe so. Yeah. This was, I, and I'll speak for Ted a little bit, this was a, a challenging design for the fact that one, we go I mean one we had to deal with the stormwater runoff and again MSD is is they're a stickler about that now and we understand why but 20 years ago we could have done a lot of things differently than we can do now uh, we looked at orientation and if you oriented the whole thing to the side then you, we were worried about grades worried about the parking lot um, and we were the discussion came down to, one is a lot of the usage from the bathrooms are not only from the people using the park, but from the trail users. Uh, so a lot of people running will stop in and get a quick drink of water and go to the bathroom. And we saw you know, a greater usage of the bathrooms than that pavilion area on a regular basis. So those were the kind of the factors, especially staff thought uh, when we start looking at design and, and orientation. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, I, um, so I think I'm gonna answer your question or my question um, in this, but so shifting the, the whole pavilion forward is not doable. Um, to get it a, a little bit more depth behind behind it is because of the ADA grades and, and all of the other stuff, right? Yep, exactly. Well, a sewer, yeah, a sewer, sewer easement, easement. okay. So. Yeah, that's the other thing is we have that sewer going right through the park. Okay. Yeah, Jack. I have a question, not really on the design, but more for Eric. Is it your preference, Ted had mentioned that it's gonna be heated to keep the bathroom open year round. That's your preference to do? Yeah, two things is, one of the things that we look at, and um, 
I think we talked about this, is well, door access, you know, we're going more electronic door access, so it's easy to make sure it gets locked up at 10 o'clock and, and opens up the next morning uh, instead of having to someone physically go out there and lock the door. Uh, and then secondarily, um, the, you know, just being able then, that makes it easy to like, say it's a beautiful day in December. We can unlock the bathrooms. It's already, we don't have to, you know, since it hasn't been winterized, it's stuff is ready to go. Uh, we've done that a few times in Memorial Park and Oak Tree Park specifically. Um, it'd be nice to do it here. And even if we didn't, even if we shut down the whole winter, uh, maintenance wise, it's much easier and you, and you don't have the, the fear of pipes freezing, even if you winterize it, you don't have, you know, the porcelain cracking with the water that's, you know, it might seep in. So uh, it's all restrooms, all park restrooms are going to heated restrooms for that reason, not just here, but I mean, it's really industry standard now. Okay, any other questions, comments? Yeah, Nancy. And how are we budgeting for this and over how many years? Yeah, so ultimately, we, you know, budget is, is uh, you know, on forefront of all of our minds. And what we had, had put in for the budget last year and, and it got removed for uh, budget cuts reasons is to uh, package it over two years. Uh, we'd want to start when the park is not in use anyway. So we want to start construction in October, uh, early October, mid-October. And so you're basically hopefully paying for half of it one year and the other half the next year and you're done by late February, early March with plantings, maybe April, but that way you, you still have a season. So you, we're really packaging it over two budget years anyway, just by the, the preference of how we do construction. Now, if we get a wet year like this year, but that, we won't worry about that. It'll be like next week all when we do this project. Okay. So what, do you need a motion on this to? Uh, I don't know, honestly. I mean, we, we kind of started this with Brentwood Bound. We felt like it was, it was good to kind of have these conversations with the committee and make sure everyone's on the right track. And yeah, we've got a that. lot of good, you know, things tonight out of this. So I think more than anything else, we just wanted to continue what we'd start with Brentwood Bound and what we'll probably continue to do moving forward. But if you're happy we'll with it. In the, in the budget process, funding, 23, 24. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks, Ted. Great. All right. One item down. Yes. I have a lot. I apologize. Uh, so I'll try and make some of these quicker uh, for my monthly report, which is uh, the snow cone stand. We uh, staff met with Carrie Trostel, uh, Bull and I met with her, uh, and she came up with a couple uh, ideas and questions. One is she'd like a couple designated parking spots. Uh, she's hoping maybe two to three. Uh, she said she'd be willing to add an additional $50 a month for the lease. Uh, I'd say 90% of the time that's not an issue at all because really the park's not busy, but on the weekends when parks are busy, we'll, we'll run out of parking space. And I think that is her concern is that when that happens and people just drive by instead of stopping for snow cones. Uh, I, you know, I think it's perfectly acceptable. Uh, I think for, you know, for the, the small times it would be very busy, it'd be okay. Uh, so I would uh, recommend doing that. And then she also wanted to move her tables and chairs, which right now are on Eager Boulevard. And like her, like everyone else, has seen additional traffic. So they, she wants to move it west and move it back so that way it's kind of off the road. Again, that's just a green space that only has picnic tables there now for the snow cone stand. So ultimately, the space is kind of designed for them anyway. So staff doesn't have any issue with that as well. So if you're okay with that, we'll approve both of those. Yeah. Make a motion or just mm -hmm. no. I, I will make a motion that we allow this um, the snow cone stand to have three uh, parking spots designated uh, for their purposes that their rent will be increased fifty dollars a month and that tables are allowed to be moved west uh, as as uh, the owner would like second great and and would we put the signs in for those three parking spots or would we actually have that she might, offered seemed, to do that herself I mean, we're, do we have any issues with that, or do we need to do it? I mean, we, we can do it, obviously. Yeah. I'd <laughs> I think if, if she can give us, like, the, the sign, we can, yeah. And that's something my staff can do. I know Dan has, like, a sign. Yeah, we have a post. Yeah, posting, post so we can take care of that. Yeah, Jeff. I mean, I did have a question about the signs themselves. And is this designated <laughs> parking spaces, uh, I mean, obviously her, her, her business is seasonal. What happens when? We would take the signs down. Okay. 
Um, so it's, yeah, it'll it's only be during the season. During the season that she's open, and then right. only during hours of her operation. So is is, is her sign going to have a? We can talk to her. Hours of. Yeah. We okay. can, we can have that added on. And then um, enforcement. What? How are we enforcing? How can we enforce that? Or if is it just on our system of hoping people do the right thing? Kind of like what we have here at City Hall by the library. You know, there's a spot for the firefighters and then everything else for the patrons of the library and, and City Hall and on our system. Okay. All right, any other questions? All right, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Great. All right, uh, the dead end of Eager Road, uh, we talked about this a uh, month or two ago. So staff has removed all the brush, we've got the wood chips down, and at the last committee we said once that was done, we'd come back and have a uh, discussion on what we should do. Uh, I think uh, staff would recommend that we speak first with Brentwood Forest and give them the first, you know, crack of first remo uh, refusal, and if not, then maybe go to the uh, owner of 87 Chafford Woods to see if uh, basically we'd vacate that property to them because the city does own it. Yeah, so it looks great, first of all, thank you. Um, so Bremen Force has their own, they call it Buildings and Grounds Committee. Um, so I can find out when that meeting is and let you know, and if we can present something to them, and um, I know you're aware, but it's the same sort of thing. It's full of honeysuckle and it's gonna keep continuing growing, so um, it makes more sense that they're going to be over there and treating it and um, that house just sold that Trafford Woods house So okay. there's a new owner that we could go to I okay. have had kind of preliminary discussions with Brown force about it and they're kind of non-committal to anything, but um, I think it, the first step would be to go before their committee So I'll figure out that date that and meeting. go yeah. from there. Just let me know when it is Do we need a motion for that or is that just good enough? So uh, the next thing is we've, we've talked about it in the uh, weekly report, but uh, we're going to kind of start a what we're calling a galactic glow uh, uh, skate. So we did uh, install black light paint. We added some pictures. Hopefully you guys think it's cool as we do. Uh, we think it's going to be fun. And because of it, you know, most anytime you have a special skate, you increase prices a little bit. So we thought a $2 surcharge for that and a little bit more for the party packages. Uh, so we bring those to you guys. We'd like to start this right away. This is why we're bringing it now, not with our 23 recommendations. So we'd like to kind of start this when we reopen on Monday. I think so, right? Yes. So I'd like to make a motion that um, uh, the Parks and Rec Department is allowed to charge increased fees for Galactic Glow as um, noted in um, the Report. Second. All right. And, and will it be uh, when you start it? Will it be a regular, recurring thing that happens? Or yeah, we're looking at Friday nights because we want to do it at night. And we're we're right now summertime. We might look at every other week. But we if we it goes well, we're thinking maybe weekly. And we're also toying around with the idea of an adult only glow skate. Um, you know those type of things. So we're playing around. But we just we kind of just we're excited. Just want to get going. Yeah. All right, uh, I guess all those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Great. All right, uh, we did open the bids for the Memorial uh, Park Pedestrian Bridge. Uh, there's a lot to do before we bring that to the committee. Uh, th that's a steel bridge, uh, so if you, uh, I'm foreshadowing, it was not a good bid opening. But it is, uh, luckily, later on, I'll show you how I'll pay for it by the savings of our other projects. So, uh, so that will be coming next month at the recommendation. And then lastly, we were supposed to talk about park maintenance again. Two things, I know we have a lot on our agenda and I can't get my computer to work. So I don't know if we wanna to try to do this next month. Or you want me to try to run through it today? You okay next month? I think I'm okay with next, next well, month. Well, I'm, yeah, I'll probably be remote, but. But next month will be stormwater management and uh, stormwater master plan. Yeah, two brass. Great. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. All right, thanks, Eric. Anything for Suscom while you're up here, by the way? Uh, no, we continue moving forward. Uh, Suscom did have a, a quick conversation about uh, parking requirements as related to the new ordinance. Uh, they made a recommendation to the Planning Development Department that that new uh, project in Hanley Industrial 
uh, that the required parking for EV ready and, and or EV spaces EV ready, which should be uh, should be um, based on the uh, residential parking, not residential and commercial. So it will lower the requirement. So that's their recommendation. And again, I know that's something that the board will be talking about on uh, the 20th. And does, do we need to do anything with that recommendation or? I, I think it's more a recommendation to, you know, if you guys want to, uh, I guess, yeah, if you wanna, you know, take that recommendation to the board when you have the discussion on that next board meeting, say this is a recommendation of okay. the SUSCOM. If you wanna take a vote agreeing with that, you could probably do that too. I think that's really kind of up to you guys. I would say we just wait until the, the big board if, I mean, when we're approving the full plan. Okay. All right. Eric has a, is he a graduate student or an undergrad in urban planning? Oh, he's been approved yet. Working the intern. Oh, no, he's an intern. Interviewing both. Oh. <laughs> is he good at building bridges? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, producing so we, steel. <laughs> yeah, we do have a couple yeah. interns we're interviewing. Both of them had an interest in sustainability. Oh. So we might have an intern working on our sustainability plan with me. Please share the word when they start, if they start. All right, we'll go on to the consent agenda. The only item is the, the meeting minutes. Motion to approve. Second. Second. All right, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All right, moving to old business. ADA pickup space in Brentwood Forest, another Jack thing. It's not, not Brentwood, Brentwood Forest. It's not Brentwood yeah. Forest. <laughs> Brentwood Courts apartments. Correct. They're the ones bringing the request. I was not at the last meeting, and I um, was informed in reading the meeting minutes that we were supposed to do something. Eric. Um, it was go part? investigate what the investigate issue is. Try and understand what the issue really is. Right. We're still working on that. Okay, so we'll assume that just right. holds on. They're okay. I mean, everything is, we, they have places to park. Um, they park on the side. Uh, you know, would it be easier for him, he said, if we could do that? Sure. But ultimately, it's not affecting uh, the, the magic bus at all. Yeah, so quick, talking to Kathy earlier, so I, to clarify, I think, I don't think the request is actually coming from the apartment complex. I think it's more Alderman O'Neill saw it and suggested it. And so I don't know, maybe Dan knows there's a sidewalk that's like being replaced up there. That's not anything we're doing, is it? <clears throat> okay, so there's, what she's mentioning is that there's not a curb cut to cross. So where there's the no parking handicap only, it's just a regular curb, so someone in her mind could not walk across that. Um, but I don't know, did anyone try and talk to the uh, apartment complex? I did not. Okay. So I don't, I, it's not something that the apartment complex is asking for, and if the magic bus driver, there's gonna be, as if you've driven up there, those new townhomes are going up and parking's already getting. The Evo apartment complex across the street raised the parking rent, so now, they're parking in Brentwood Forest more, and so that, I have a concern that if we take away more spots, we're gonna, so unless that apartment complex was requesting it is where I'm coming from, at least. Nothing at this point. In my opinion, as long as the Magic bus is not seeing an issue or they haven't heard complaints from the resident. Yeah. Sounds good. Any, any issues with that? Just table it, and if there's future problems, come on back. Okay. Move on to item B, agreement with site centers and city of Brentwood. This is about the Evans-Howard monument. Absolutely, B, C, D are all related. And um, we have been in communication with site centers. We have provided them um, the city's edit to their agreement. I was hoping that we would have it by now, which is why it's on the agenda. So they're still working on it. So um, I, would, I would recommend that we leave this item on till the next meeting, hopefully we will have heard from them by then. So no action required tonight. Okay. The next item in sharing this with the city attorney, the recommendation is that since they've already raised some funds, that there be a resolution 
accepting the donations that have been raised so far. And that's what item C. Um, and if there's um, support for that, then we would put it on the 20th for the Board of Alderman meeting to formally adopt that resolution. Yeah, Nancy. So I have a question about the um, one particular word in the resolution. Um, it says in section two, it says the committee re commits to return these funds to the donors in the event the city does not commence construction. So does that mean we're gonna give it back to the Brentwood Historical Society? Yes. And should it say donor? Or I guess I just didn't want us to be on the hook for returning it to everyone who donated to right. the Historical Society. Good point. So that was my we, only. We can, we can talk to Dan Fitzgerald. Yeah, okay. And then if he's in agreement, change it to the Brentwood Historical Society. Or donor, or like do may just make donor. it singular. I, I mean. Okay, we can do, that might be simpler. Okay, so that was just, that was the only thing I saw. Okay, anybody want to make a motion to accept this resolution and kick it up to the board with that change? Uh, I'll make that motion uh, with, with the adjustment uh, in the language that Alderwoman Tice mentioned, uh, make a motion that uh, we accept, move to the full board of accepting the donation for the Edward uh, Evans Howard Monument. Second. Great, any other questions, conversation? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Great. The third item, D, selection of contractor Dan, um, vendor for the construction of the monument. We Ian, I believe you've seen a rendering of what it was supposed to look like whenever a couple meetings ago. Um, what I'm trying to do is get like a turnkey contract to do everything. So the way it was originally bid by one vendor was to do the concrete pad, do the brick pillars, manufacture the sign, everything's turnkey. They'll put everything together and send us an invoice. So that's a little complicated because when I've called other sign vendors, they'll just do the sign. You know, no, I've only have one so far that said that they could do the uh, brick and concrete work for sure, and then the other one said that they would do it and then they'll just pass through the cost. So once I get two competitive bids, then we can route it through the you know capital approval process. Because this, so far I know that it's underneath the threshold that we set, so we should be good. The cost has gone up from the initial right. bid. It's what, $13,000 now, and it right. was 11,000 when they yeah, started this last year. 11,403. So th there's, there's a little increase there. It would be funded. We'll, we'll bring that back to you when we're near that stage from streets and sidewalks. We don't ever really spend all that money. So there should be enough money to cover this cost. Um, we expect that you'll be able to obtain quotes? I believe so. And if I can't, what I was going to do is just break it into two separate components I'll have a sign vendor, which I know at least four or five are interested in just the sign manufacturing. And then I'll have to find a separate contractor that does flat work, you know, just the concrete pad. We could do the pad actually in house, but we're not brick layers at all. And I don't want it to look poorly and have a nice sign, but shoddy brick work. No action at this time. Okay. Bird is the word, item E. Made that up on the fly. That's a bird joke. Yeah. You get it? And the fly, yeah. I mean, yeah, you yeah. know, come on. Yeah. He's on a roll. Get it? Kids are, the older they get, they're gonna really give you trouble with the dad jokes. I don't, they don't have a choice. <laughs> so I know this was asked to be put on the agenda for tonight, and, um, you know, so I just thought I'd run down a quick kind of timeline of how we got here. So we started in 2018 uh, with the Public Works Committee uh, to talk about a dockless bike program. It was actually a presentation started by uh, Lime Bike and OFO, uh, which were two bike companies that were in St. Louis. Uh, by the time we brought, you know, we, the Public Works Committee at that time said, yeah, let's move forward with, the, you know, with putting something together. And it was a partnership with Maplewood and Richmond Heights. And by the time we brought it to, back to Public Works in 2019, Lime and OFO were both gone out of the city of St. Louis. And so we kind of at that point talked about changing it from a bike just to a small vehicle permit 
so that it basically, whether it's a bike, uh, whether it's anything else that might come up in the future, I mean, I think at that time, scooters may have been started. I'm not 100% sure. I don't remember when the scooter craze started. But if we're even talking about, you know, the flying, uh, you know, things that you see in Back to the Future. We're trying to be, trying to figure out what we could do in the future, you know. So, uh, and so that's what we brought back to the Public Works in 2019, went to the board in March. And then in June of 2020, we brought it back uh, because the city of Clayton wanted to join. And so once we did that, uh, once again, the board approved the permit and permit application. So the permit basically, ap the, the permit application and the resolution and the intergovernmental agreement basically state that if uh, you know a company uh, fulfills the requirement of the permit uh, that the staff you know staff would have to give a recommendation to the city administrators so uh, bird came in they provided everything that we requested out of the permit we uh, passed on Ebola and the other three cities agreed to move forward and I think that's kind of where we're at today so they're supposed to launch June 20th So I, you know, I was here for all of these, and and when we were having these conversations about bikes, it was always we always said that scooters were not going to be kind of part of this. I remember when we changed the the ordinance to to make it small vehicles, but you know, I went back and watched YouTube, and I remember you saying and saw you say, you know, but not scooters, right? I mean, so I was a little blindsided by this personally uh, about it being scooters. Um, that being said, I I don't even understand where the scooters would be allowed, and and. You know, the thought on the, the bikes was that it was going to allow people to kind of move amongst the cities very easily. I don't think that's possible on a scooter uh, because they can, you know, they could ride a bike in a lot of areas that you couldn't take a scooter. So I'm just having a hard time visualizing this. And, and then just for one more data point, I was curious if the Great Rivers Greenway allowed scooters on theirs. And, and so I asked somebody over there and they said, no, that's up to each municipality, but 95% uh, of GRG does allow them. Um, and they, they were pretty positive about the experience on GRG, so that was a good piece of data that I got as well. So I'm, I'm honestly a little confused of what this is even going to look like. Like, where would they be able to ride them? Sure. Uh, I mean, the, the, the permit says is in the in right-of-ways, um, and, and ultimately the city's part of the, the terminology in there is the city can dictate where exactly they can go. Uh, I mean, I to be honest, uh, I don't remember that conversation on and Wiggy, so I apologize. No worries. Um, you know, I, when I first started this, I thought it was a bike thing, like you, you said. Uh, but we were trying to figure out what to do for the future. Um, I think, you know, when, when I talked to Bull about this, I see this being, you know, popular in Clayton's central business district. I see it being in downtown Maplewood, you know. I could see it going from the Metrolink stop to the Galleria. Uh, you know, I don't, you know, for me, I don't know if I would tool around in a scooter in Brentwood, but I mean, that's the, you know, the agreement that we had all come up with. So, uh, you know, if you, you know, if you think about where anything is, it's basically going from maybe from a Metrolink stop to a shopping area. So, I mean, those what's I could see. GRG, like you said, is, is they do like those. They, they are positive about them because what they see is a sustainable mode of transportation and especially with GRG's connection of trails, you can get from downtown St. Louis to St. Charles one day, and if you can do that on a scooter and not have to use combustible fuel, I think that's why they see that as a, a positive, in fa uh, uh, positive impact. Uh, my always question always been was, how do you uh, maintain where they're going to park these things and make sure they're in, in proper areas? And again, the, the application says that they have to have staff available 24 hours a day, and they have a certain amount of time uh, that they, depending on the time of day and weekend and holidays, where they have to remove it if it's not in a, you know, approved area. And for the regular day, it's two hours. So they have to be out, out there within two hours. Um, and ultimately, you know, I think Bird has, they said they have three contractors whose job it is is to go around the city of St. Louis and then also here would, would be coming here in Brentwood to maintain their, uh, their scooters. So um, that's, I don't know if that answered your question fully, Alderman Weggy, but uh, you know, it's. it's well, have, have we, because have we, have, part of the permitting process is that we, the city, have to approve where their zones for drop off and, and things are, correct? Because they would be on city property or in right-of-ways. 
it, what we say is that we can dictate where we want. And if we want to work on something that we a little bit more, uh, uh, say, you know, we can geofence. So we can put a geofence that tells them where the bikes or scooters should go and where they should not go. And to the point where I believe uh, the scooters will actually stop working if you go through that geofenced area. So we could definitely work on those type of things if that's what the, we want to do. Well, I mean, like in their proposal, they haven't specifically called out where, you know, the, the scooter rack is going to be in the town. And, and we don't, again, the permit does not require one. Um, we, can, we can make them have one if that's what we want to do, but it is not a requirement of the application. Yeah, Jeff. I mean, I know, uh, with the scooters, I, as I understand them, they, they don't really have a, a rack or anything like that. They just sort of end up anywhere they are, and if, they're, if the battery's dead, then they go and pick them up and go charge them. Um, in fact, I think they were paying some people that have the app to go ahead and take them and plug them in and charge them on their own. You know, I agree with you. I think if we have current, current Brentwood, I don't really see the application of these because um, if they're in the retail areas that we have on the north side, it's so congested. The parking lots are, are bad as it is. I don't, I, if we had scooters going around everywhere, I could see some conflicts happening with all that traffic. And, um, you know, I just don't see the application of it in the north side of, of Brentwood. When, when and if Manchester Road is redeveloped and it becomes more pedestrian friendly and it's next to the GRG, sure, I could see that, but that's, you know, several years from now. So I, I just have an issue with where these would be. I, the last thing I would want is having these along our pathways chucked into the creeks or, you know, laying all over our park, uh, you know, for just because somebody wanted to go on a joyride and then dump it, right? Um, I think a lot of, uh, the intent is interesting. I think a lot of people are using them as entertainment rather than modes of transportation. Um, so I, I just, I, I've got the same concerns. Yeah, Nancy. So I will echo the, the entertainment instead of uh, modes of transportation. So I've always heard of them from my college age children and that is what they use them for. Uh, I did see them in New York City. We were just in New York over Memorial Day and they have all, the, they've done so much with biking and scootering. So separate from the sidewalk, now there are bike lanes all over New York and there's a lane for bikes and scooters and you can, they're the city bikes that you can take everywhere and they have scooters and it's kind of phenomenal. Um, but they're not interspersed with, on the sidewalks and there's a designated lane for them and I think my it's probably a, a more of an issue for the public safety committee but the, my question is where are we where are people are allowed to ride these currently can they go on our trails if they can go on the trails then can the can um, golf carts go on the trails what's the difference uh can they go on streets can they go on sidewalks what what if you know what if someone falls on a sidewalk i guess i just have a lot of questions i'm not necessarily saying i'm against it but i think there seems to be some um t's to cross and i's to dot before we have them all over town. That's all. As, as it stands today, would they be allowed on our trails? I want to say I don't believe they are based on what's in the application. It's only right away and, and parks and trails are, are considered, are not considered right away. Or is a sidewalk considered right away? Yes. Well, making sure I'm right on that one, Bull. Sidewalks considered right away, yes. I mean, I know on their website they su suggest not riding on sidewalks, which makes sense, but, you know, they can suggest a lot of things. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I, mean, I sort of have some issues with that, with little, people walking little kids and little kids walking, and we have a really mean dog walker in Ward 1 that everybody complains about, and I just can only imagine the, <laughs> the issues that would come. But. So this goes live on June twentieth, right? So that's um, because of the discussion I heard the board was having, and I've been communicating with the other cities. Um, we actually gave them an opportunity to join Eric when he met with the with the folks, and no one took us up on that. 
um, I have spoken with one city and um, city manager hasn't really had a discussion with the um, elected officials yet. But what I'm, what I'm hearing is if by chance the city um, wants to say they have had second thoughts and denied us, uh, that city would be in support of that. We do like to lead. <laughs> I mean, I, I just go back to, um, I'm not against scooters necessarily. I think once GRG is done, if, if that is a modality that on GRG, I don't, I don't see them on the sidewalk, on the 10 foot sidewalk on Manchester. I just, I don't think we want them whipping along there. Um, on GRG, I think they would be good if that's what GRG has seen and not had problems with. I mean, I, I do worry a little bit that you're walking and then, you know, somebody's whipping around. I mean, a lot of the kids have these in the neighborhoods. But other than that, I just can't see how this would be used in Brentwood at all. And, and, and it seems like, you know, we did the multi-municipality thing to, to kind of help, because I would love, I would love the, the sun and condos or whatever to be able to go shop at Trader Joe's very easily, right? But there's no way they could on a scooter, right? That wouldn't, that wouldn't help. And there was a way on a bike. Yeah, I mean, part of the issue, going back to the uh, bikeable, walkable plan, is when you talk about bike lanes, which is primarily what was discussed there, is that we don't have control over Manchester Road or Brentwood Boulevard, which would be the ideal location for bike and scooter lanes. Getting MoDOT or county to put those in is everyone's shaking their heads. They already know the answer. I mean, maybe it makes sense in Hanley Industrial as different kinds of businesses are starting to come in. You know, maybe maybe there's a lot of value there, maybe more so over time. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm still struggling with this a little bit. I mean, I'll, I'll echo what everyone else has said. I'm not against it, but I just don't see any practical use. I mean, I've ridden them myself, and people you know, around my age ride them, and you ride them when you're probably not supposed to be riding them. You know, that's when you're... <laughs> I envision these people getting one from Obi Clark's and you know riding it and then leaving. I was telling Steve earlier that I drove. They're not allowed in Maplewood currently. Is that okay? Yeah, so, there so if be. you drive, I was driving south on uh, Big Bend and there's one right on kind of the ADA accessibility on a sidewalk. So, and I and I've been on them before when it says you're not supposed to ride here, but it does. You know. It tells you to ride on the street, but does anyone listen? You know, I just envision that we're going to have these laying in someone's front yard, and you wake up in the morning and say, oh, Joe rode home last night and, you know, decided to leave it here. And then who comes and picks it up? I know who does. It's rhetorical, but. Yeah, I, I mean, going back to the line bikes, there is line bikes in the park system, even though we didn't have an ordinance approving them. I mean, it, if people were, you know, dumb enough, they can get them here already. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I think, the, you know, the, the thought of this as we started this in 2018 was let's be proactive and make sure we're ready if something comes. And more importantly, let's set a fee for it so that, you know, the city's got a little bit of bonus for doing it. Uh, and I don't know what city you're referencing, but I, I work in Clayton and park in the garage and I do see some applicability maybe there, you know, in a city like that where we walk to lunch and I don't want to get my car to the garage and it's four blocks, but it's 100 degrees outside, so let's get a scooter and ride, but we don't have that kind of situation here without having to cross a major intersection. I mean, the, the tough thing is ultimately the, the company's going to put them where they get usage. Uh, obviously, they don't know what the usage is yet because they've never done it within these four cities. Uh, the real question comes down as we launch with a hundred scooters. We've asked them, uh, where are you, you know, where are you planning on putting them to start with? And they're like, well, we're ready to launch, and we'll probably just, you know, pick a few different locations. Uh, I think, you know, once we see the data of where they're being driven, if if we move forward, would determine a lot of where they're going to be. Uh, where you, will you'll see them? So if they're not getting used, if they put a stack of five at Target and they don't get used, that they'll move those five to some place where they will get used. But there's, there will be growing pains, as you guys are all mentioning. 
and then it's, is the growing pains worth it? Yeah, Jack. Do we have to give them 100? Can we say you get 20? It's 100 spread across four municipalities. Right, I'm saying four. can we limit that down? Any, I, I guess you'd have to get agreement with every other city too, but. Yeah, I mean, at that point, you'd have to change the permit because your permit says you can launch with 100. And the 100's a minimum. Yeah. You can bump up to 250 and you'd have to show, and it says you have to show the data supporting the usage of the current 100. I'm only speaking for myself. It's it's not a lack of support. It's just a confusion about what this is going to look like. And and you know, I, I get your point about you know if if there's no demand for them and they're just sitting here and they're not working, they're going to go somewhere else. But um, I don't know. I mean, Alex, some of the experience that um, the primary city near us has had. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But I also think they'd be great on Great Rivers Greenway, right? And so maybe this is something we need to be doing now. I mean, GRG would be open in months. So it's not forever away. I mean, it seems like we should just have some rules about where they're allowed and where they aren't. And um, other than Lyme saying right in the, or Bird, excuse me, saying right in the right of way. I wonder if um, within this current application that we have, the permitting, d does it give us the ability to do s to say that? Yeah, I mean, it, it says the city can, the cities at any time can uh, create a, a geofenced area or, you know, where they're allowed, where they're not allowed. Um, I mean, not to punt it to public safety, but if you wanted to punt it to public safety, we could safety. staff, <laughs> well, staff could then, staff could develop you know, where those locations would but be. But we would have to work with the other cities and allow them to de determine where in their cities as well it would be placed since it's a intergovernmental agreement among the four. Well, it'd be nice just to know where they're gonna set them up. I mean, I guess they don't know and they'll keep moving them, but um, I don't think. Well, so, I mean, I, I think, I don't, I don't disagree with you as far as to be would potentially be nice for GRG, but it, then it comes back to the same thing I I think you have an, an issue with in the scooters themselves is about range. You got a bike, you can you've got a lot more range. Scooters these scooters are not meant to be taken for 10 miles or whatever, right? They're short distances back and forth, um, and so I mean while I tend to agree with the GRG potential, it's it's still not a high priority of GRG usage. Um, I think I do think that a good majority of this discussion is public safety in nature, and and you know I I believe that before any decisions are made, we should probably have that discussion at the public safety committee level. So, if that's a, a motion you need, I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Okay. All right. So. I guess we don't need a motion. Okay. Thanks, Eric. And none of us are on public safety. So we're <laughs> 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 Sorry, Steve. <laughs> All right, we're moving to the new business, uh, item A, the storm sewer and creek bank project. What a big night, Eric. Yeah. And I couldn't even get things to work. Um, so uh, we do, uh, we do want to choose a contractor for the Storm Sewer Creek Bank repair. And again, if you've been down to Brentwood uh, Sports Complex lately, at the end of the parking lot, there's just kind of a, the, the creek bank has given away. It failed. And so the idea of this project is to come in, clear that up. Uh, part of the reason it failed is that there's just pipes, you know, a 45 inch pipe went into a 30 inch pipe and it wasn't sealed. So the water kept seeping out. That's what led to the failure. So the idea is to basically uh, clean out that area, put in proper piping that will get the water from the park, uh, from that drainage ditch all the way um, to the creek. And so we had um, 
we had a couple alternates. One was for a flap gate balance of tide, uh, tide flux, and I kind of explained the advantages of tide flux. And the other was to uh, use uh, 370 uh, yards of fill. Uh, we seem to have a lot of dirt right now, and it's like, could we save some money by taking it over? And surprisingly, we could not, uh, I guess, because, you know, I guess dirt, finding dirt's fairly easy. And so that $3,500 change order, we'd have a change order from Keeley to take the dirt there. So that's where we just don't see the savings from it. So uh, the lowest bid was Gurdner Contracting at $122,500. Uh, we budgeted $205,000, so we're seeing a nice um, uh, savings on this. I guess the good thing is that there's just dirt moving primarily and there's not a whole lot of steel. So while we increased it some to, to, to cover, I guess we did a little bit too much, which is great. Uh, again, we, the tide flex valve is, is better. It won't uh, clog, which is a problem with the regular flap gate. And once it clogs, the water starts backing up, and then you have to go in and clear it out. So we'd like to stay with the tide flex valve, and, uh, which is why we, we don't recommend either one of the alternates. Uh, Gurdner's done a number of projects, especially for MSD. Uh, we, we talked to MSD, and they've been very satisfied with their work. Uh, we talked to a couple other references, and everyone's been happy with Gurdner. So we'd like to move forward with uh, approving authorization of Gurdner with a um, authorization for change orders not to exceed $12,250, which is 10%. Uh, and so that is our recommendation. We'd ask, ask you to pass to the Board of Aldermen. Well, it, it sounded like a motion, and so I'll turn. <laughs> I'll make the motion. I said what he just said. Second. Second. All, right. All right, we have a motion from Nancy, second from Jack. <clears throat> All right, any other questions, comments? I'm going to ask your one question that you always ask, Nancy. Where, where's the, uh, where would the money come from? It's in from? budget. Oh, it is in the budget. It's in the budget and it was savings, so I don't have a question. All right. Yeah, great. <laughs> I don't have okay. a question. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was thinking about, you know, although we have OMCI funds kind of for the stormwater master plan, I wonder if this was that. But if it's in the budget, it's in the budget. Okay, all right, uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Great. All right, move on to item B, large. <laughs> Been going through. Ah, good, and a new mic. So, uh, large St. Louis, uh, it's kind of come into Brentwood. I don't know if you noticed them. They're on the corner of McKnight Road and Litzinger. And, and we've been working with large since they've been in here. Primarily, uh, they do a, uh, a community, um, sorry, a 10th anniversary tree planting campaign. So, if a donor uh, donates $10,000 more to the large, they will uh, purchase a memorial tree in Brentwood, and then we'll get a plaque, and we'll go out. And they've already done uh, five. They actually just picked up their fifth one. So they've already done $1,250 worth of revenue as part of this partnership. So one thing they'd like to do is do a memorial walk. And they don't want a very long walk. They want something quarter of a mile or less, to be completely honest, because they don't think their members can go that long. So, you know, first thing when I was talking to uh, Alan, who's the representative, I was like, you know, starting next year, I have a great place for you. Yeah, right. Uh, and, you know, so we talked about that. And then, you know, this year we, we figure we can go starting Memorial Park, go through, you know, go around because they don't want to do the bridge. We've talked about ADA. So we can go around by the inline rink and back. And we can stay within the entire trail system. So you wouldn't need public works to shut down. You wouldn't need police or fire. I mean, we'd probably tell fire and have them. They probably want to be down there. But ultimately, there's not much uh, beyond parks and recreation staff needed for something like this. And so... What they're asking is it could be, you know, if we could kind of partner with them, they'd say the city would be a sponsor. Uh, they would um, do things like recognition at the event, with social media. Uh, you know, they talked about homemade cards, which is always nice. I always like getting those. Uh, so we think, um, you know, ultimately that it would be considered a large event, which would be $800. So that would be what the, we're giving to them in return for all this. And ultimately, I think it's a positive uh, event, and I would like to do that with them. So I guess we're asking uh, the Public Works Committee for approval to move forward with a partnership with Larch for their memorial walk. So moved. Second. Great. Sounds like a great idea. Any other comments, 
suggestion. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Great. Thank you. I think I'm done. Uh, I think so. the item first or sure uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about the update to fees and permits um, permit fees yes so we're starting the budget process um, for the midterms and I know that in March of last year sorry the staff report uh, there was an initial discussion about looking at the building permit fees and I also wanted to look at the planning and zoning um, commission fees um, and this was also brought up when we adopted the 20, this year's budget. Currently, we charge $6 per $1,000 of the project cost for any building permits. Um, so I did a comparison with the other cities. That is in the lower third of, area, of the area cities. So we would look to increase that to $7 per 1,000, which is in line with Frontenac, Creve Coeur, lower than Sunset Hills, but it would put us in the upper middle range of the area cities for that. We also currently do not charge for any occupancy inspections. The new tenant or new homeowner pays the $45 fee after the inspection as part of their permit. And I understand there was some discussion about charging for that inspection, so we would like to charge the $45 for that. And then the permit, occupancy permit itself would then also be $45. Um, so additionally, the credit card companies charging the city three, um, a percentage of all transaction by credit card through MyGov. Um, most cities do include a processing fee or a convenience fee. So we would like to include that on ours, um, on any credit card transaction through MyGov. Um, or it, actually in general, even if it's not through MyGov. Um, as we've been getting updated business license, those have generally cost the city on an annual basis about $30,000. So we would look to pass that on to the applicants, which is in line with most of the cities that we've surveyed. Um, we do not have any fees for the architectural review board or for site plan review. The $100 fee is for a conditional use permit or rezoning to cover those costs. However, our costs are significantly higher than that as we pay all of our members. So we would like to establish um, like a minimum of a, for the Architectural Review Board of $250, uh, Board of Adjustment $500 fee, Site Plan Review at the Planning and Zoning $500 fee, conditional use permits we would up to $750, and rezoning and text amendments would be 752. As those take more expense because of the court reporter for any public hearings and noticing in the newspaper, that kind of thing. Um, we also provide zoning verification letters at no cost right now, um, which most cities do charge. So we would look to have a $25 fee for that. And um, so this meeting, I just kind of wanted your feedback, some thoughts on that, and we would come forward with more specific legislation. Yeah, Jeff. I, I've got a question as it relates to the occupancy permitting fees. Um, I mean, it does seem like we're charging the resident $45, but we're not charging for the inspection fee at all. Correct. Um, which 45 for the resident is, is pretty high when you look across the board on on some of this um, you know I, I do I do think we should we should be adding an inspection fee for you know uh, property owners um, I just I don't know if, if do we need to have it 45 for both or is there a way to reduce the burden for residents to move in but actually just charge more f a little bit for um, uh, the inspection fee itself. Um, just curious. I mean, no, as a property owner in Richmond Heights, I know I take on the burden of 
the inspection of $65. But I always, it's always a benefit when I talk to residents, potential residents, and say, the occupancy permit fee for living here is only $15 to you. So it's a little bit of a, like, oh, that's great. You know, it just seems like kind of a high price for a resident when we're trying to compete with other municipalities that surround us for folks to move in. Just curious on that. We can certainly look further into that. Um, any specific building, I will say any specific building questions and inspections, uh, David Fairgrieve is logged in or should be. Um, so we can ask him, but that is something that we can look at. Yeah, I mean, if we, if we started to charge for the inspection fee, but then had maybe a slight reduction for the resident, I don't know if, we could, you know. Yeah, we could look into doing that. I know we had talked, and this might be before your time, but you know we were we were getting called out for inspections multiple times, and I know we were trying to put a a pain fee on on multiple. It was like you got one free reinspection, and then right. you had to pay the the fee again. Is yeah, that in there so, as well? Yeah. Oh, I did include that in there. I apologize for not mentioning it. Um, yes. So most people do get the initial Hello. inspection as it, part of any inspection. They get the initial and any re one reinspection, and then the fee after that would be twenty-five dollars. So that's what we would um, include here as well. Okay, so that change hasn't been made, but you're proposing that as part of this, right? Yeah, that, that seems like a good thing to do. I agree. That was going to be my point. <laughs> and I, I like Jeff's kind of. Also, it seems like the occupancy. Who, who really has the ability to? affect that and that's the property owner not the person moving in right so if it fails the occupancy inspection then then that person has to call the the owner and that that makes a lot more sense honestly the to be on the building owner to me I, i'm not sure on the the board of adjustment I, I know that's low and it doesn't cover the cost and maybe there's a philosophical debate on whether we're trying to recoup all our costs on these things or or are we doing it for the good of the community um, but but i think Maybe that needs to be raised a little bit, but like the 500 seems extremely high because sometimes they're they're honestly, I know that the intent there is to avoid frivolous things coming forward, but sometimes they're just very minor, um, you know, a feature of the the property that the the house was built on 85 years ago, and um, I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure I personally would be in favor of raising that so high. Okay, we can. Um I know that in Creep Four the fee was three hundred dollars, so we can certainly look at um, lowering that a little bit. But yeah, the the philosophy is like we're here to provide a service; they should be able to go to the board. But then you don't want to make it too cheap, where you keep getting repeated right. um, applications, kind of thing. To really think about, do I need this variance? <laughs> can it be designed elsewhere, some other way? Yeah. Yeah, Jack. So, and this is not a citywide problem, but this is a Ward 4 problem that I know you're probably familiar with and we'll hear about it, but Brentwood Forest requires the occupancy permit to get certain, a pool pass and whatnot. So this, what are, what are we changing? Because I know it's changed through the years for that. So if someone came, so a lot of times in a Brentwood Forest, a new person will move in and to get that person a pool pass, they have to be put on the occupancy permit. So are we now requiring to have an inspection done, which would be an additional fee at that point? Um, any change in tenant, yes, is requires a new, well, not any change. If, if the head of household remains and you have someone else coming and living with you, that's not a change in tenant, but any change in. Okay, I just want to clarify well, that wasn't yeah. changing. Yeah. Just that the would head be of household. They would still be required to get the occupancy permit. This would just pay for the occupancy inspection. Okay. Which has to be completed and signed off and um, approved, and any work has to be completed prior to issuing the, the actual occupancy permit. Okay. So. Thank you for clarification. Yeah, Nancy. Yeah, I generally think this is great, and thank you for the time that you've spent uh, going into this. And I um, wondered about some of the larger jumps. Uh, the board of adjustment, as Brandon mentioned, and then. Um, uh, like the site plan review, I know there's a lot of work that goes into these, but are those consistent? I guess, can we just get some information about if we're consistent with what other communities are doing? So, yes, um, um, 
and I didn't bring it up here, but in the packet is information. There's an Excel spreadsheet that provides where we pulled all of the information from, from the other cities. Yeah, I did look at that, um, and it's... Board of I Adjustment, I just kind of, <laughs> since we have five standing members and three alternates, and to <laughs> have a meeting, we need at least four. We like to have five. We pay them $100 each, so I just thought that would at least cover that. Um, it would not cover staff time or um, the court reporter that has to attend and legal that has to attend. And uh, we have that on TV, but um, <laughs> so it wouldn't cover everything. That's where I kind of pulled the 500 from. So I could see about lowering it. Um, site plan review, I know I didn't want to go too high because we also contract out and have the applicant pay for the landscaping and traffic studies. But in Creep Core, the application was a $250 a application fee and a $2,000 escrow. And my experience is on smaller projects is most of that escrow is returned back. Projects ran between five and $600. So that's where I was looking at that as a comparison. Um, plus we have 13 members now, and they also get paid, so um, that's where I was looking at. Um, well, I guess, seven. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think any of them are unreasonable. I just yeah. <laughs> want to make sure that we're consistent with other communities and that we're not driving development. Yeah, um, and I was, I was trying to be in points. the middle range, because yeah. I do know Olivet, for the ARB, any new home is like up to $750, and I didn't want to go that too high. Um, but I kind of want to you know, make sure that when we get an application, it's going to get built, and suddenly the developer is like, oh, I'm going to change the exterior, <laughs> and we're like, you have to go back, that there's a penalty that he has to, you know, think twice. Um, instead of, I'll just go back. <laughs> Which is um, good. I mean, I think there's a lot of times people just go back. And yeah. Occupancy permit, ARB, I'm sure there are lots of people that do that to you all. And <laughs> Something that might help the committee is, as you all think through this, it, I can liken it to a community center, the heights in particular. Oftentimes you're not looking for 100% recovery. It could be 75%. You come up with a percentage. So if that helps you get to a comfortable point on this, that's something worth considering as well. And uh, the other thing that's in the memo that I did not mention was also we do want to have a uh, penalty fee for any stop work order for building permits, that if you're caught without doing work without a permit, that the, the building permit fees double. Um, so, okay. Got to follow the rules. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can I ask one question yeah. about the grid? So on the grid, and thank you for, I did look at it, um, and thank you for having me notice it again, but um, the demo permit SFR. Single family residential. Okay, so our demo permit's 5,000, and then it just, that just, yeah. everything else is really low, or these, I mean, I can't imagine somebody only pays $50 to demolish a house in Maryland Heights. Um, um. I mean, we're, we're like way, I mean, everybody yeah. else is like a couple hundred dollars at the most. So I just was curious about that particular one. I can certainly look at that. Um, okay. A little high, but I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, that just, just seems so out of line. What how ours are compared, that might be the escrow to make sure the public util right of way is, is restored, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, David, if you're on the line, do you have any insight on that fee? I don't think he's on the line. Oh, he is there. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I didn't quite hear. Was there a question? I apologize. What 
On the demo permit, single family residential, our permit fee is $5,000. What all does that include? As no, part it's not $5,000. I don't know how my gov is configured like that, but there's a $1,000 uh, deposit, which is fully refundable to the contractor once the job is done. Um, but then the calculation for it is based on the same formula that we have in place for other building permits, which is $6 per $1,000, $25 per inspection. And there are three inspections on a demolition project. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, sure. I will make that change. Okay, so what's the, what happens next? So Whitney, you're gonna take the the input from us, I guess, and then. Yeah, and then we'll bring it back at the future right. budget process, yeah. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, David. All right, Dan, we got streets RFP. Okay. This one's pretty straightforward, you know, each year, um, with the exception of 2020, we go out for bids um, based on which streets we believe have the highest priority and, and need to be repaired. Uh, this year, we went out for bids, received those on the 31st. We only received one uh, bid this year. Last year, we got three. This year, we only received one. So I'm assuming everybody's busy or, you know, they don't have staffing. I'm sure there's a litany of reasons why. So whenever I put together the little bid tab, I tried to compare um, what we have in the budget versus what these came in at. So Park Ridge was the base bid that we were looking at, and that one came in significantly over what we had budgeted. So if you look at the budget book um, underneath our uh, subtotal, we have, what do we see, $74,992. That was what I had budgeted, but the actual price came in at a little over 254,000, so closer to 255. However, ice cream specialties we were able to do in last year's budget and actually get it all done, so that was a carryover, so we really can use that 220,000, as well as the uh, promenade. We actually do own that strip of the promenade, basically from Total Wine to PetSmart. I know we had TWM look at that, so we've been keeping it together, you know, patched together well enough that it's passable and there's no issues there. So I'm taking that sub unit of 136,800, putting it towards, you know, Park Ridge, and then what I did was add up the total of streets that were budgeted, came up with 431,957 dollars. Then when I take away the 254 to get uh, Park Ridge done, then I wanted to see, well, what could I do of these alternates? So whenever I looked at the alternates, we had 10 alternates, A1 through A10. I included the RFP in your packet, and I thought, well, in my mind, I would probably do A8. So what that is, it's uh, south of Strassner, but on the west side of Hanley Industrial. So when you come to that four-way stop, like, you know, just north of the police and like west of Buffalo Wild Wings and that, that's that four-way stop. So if you drive through the intersection, it's getting poor pretty much on every leg of the intersection. It's, it's pretty old slabs. And then I also looked at A9, which is the asphalt portion going south of that intersection, basically from the police all the way south towards end graphics and what used to be Hampton Envelope. And I thought, well, that would be a good job because it's asphalt, and asphalt's typically cheaper than concrete. Plus, I know with that new uh, development that's there that Post owns the property, sold it, and you know, that's gonna be the Planet Fitness and a nice new um, development there. I thought, well, that would probably look nice to have new asphalt through there, because there's several pavement patches, you know, either utilities or for whatever reason, you know, there's failures and you can see all the different cracks here. And then lastly, um, A10, which is Evans. That's that stub that comes from Brentwood Boulevard going east into the parking garage. The city owns that section of Evans as do we own the alley that goes behind that building to the east of, I guess it's a Joseph White building, all the way up to Rose. You know, that alley belongs to the city. The alley's in good shape. It's just that little stump of Evans that isn't. And it would kind of make sense to do because we did Urban, Strassner, Renwood last year. And if we did Evans, then we can kind of keep them close to the same vintage. And whenever we do sealants, we could do maybe three or four sealants in that area, you know, 
I know that's how we did streets in the past. So like Spanish, urban, woodsy, you know, that clump of streets was done. As other streets were done, they were tried to keep them focused in a tight little area. The other thing I didn't put in the memo, but I thought about later was, since there's only one bid, if you didn't want to do Park Ridge and trade, say, to do that intersection, you could possibly do A6, which is 274,000, and that's basically Hanley Industrial Court at Strassner going north up towards the Brentwood School District, getting rid of those slabs and doing more of the intersection. So what I originally recommended was, you know, trying to balance between residential and commercial, do Park Ridge, and this would be the Park Ridge, the east half, because the west half was already replaced when Missouri American damaged the slabs when they put in a new water main. It looks strange when you drive that strip of Park Ridge between White and Litzinger, one half is good. It looks like a before and an after. So I thought, well, it'd probably be nice to do that now, but if you wanted to trade and do strictly the commercial, I guess you could, but the original recommendation was to keep with Park Ridge. That way the residential part's done for those blocks and then do A8, 9, and 10. And then we would still, if we did the original recommendation, we'd still have a little bit of savings like 46,000. And I thought, well, you could use that savings for, we're waiting on quotes for sealant. You know, we, we met with Missouri Petroleum, they're supposed to give us a quote to do McKnight, similarly to what was done in Ladue, as well as seal some of our other streets, which we had postponed during the height of COVID. So just wanted to check and see which way you wanted to go, and then we would need a motion to take to the full board for a resolution. And this is with Byrne and Jones. They're the ones that did the job last year. I think they did a pretty good job, so. Yeah, and if we just, if we chose to not do any of these just because we only got one bidder and the prices were so much higher, could we carry that budget over in the next year and then maybe try again in the 2023 street paving plan? I know everybody's costs are higher. I've spoken with Maplewood. Maplewood said they talked to Chesterfield, Richmond Heights. I don't know. With supply chain and all these other excuses, inflation, I don't see inflation changing much in 23. That's just my personal opinion. Maybe 24. I mean, I feel like the Cubs, you know, better luck next year. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I would hope that it would go down, but if it didn't, I'd feel bad not doing anything and then I'd get even less done. Yeah, Nancy. Well, I would hate to see us not do any streets. Uh, we're, we're seeing prices go up everywhere. Um, I just, uh, it's unfortunate we only have one bid, so I think that is more of an issue. It's not so much the cost. Um, uh, I would not be serving my residents or neighbors uh, well if I didn't say I feel like we should do the residential street, um, especially the south end of Park Ridge is pretty bad. Mm -hmm. um, as it gets in the middle of the block, it's not, there's a lot of patching, but it's not as bad, but the south end is, is uh, Yeah, because if you look at the little bad. drawing, it includes like part of white where right. Park Ridge warps around because we know that's a bad area. Yeah. Um, but, oh, and then um, I, I know it's not in the budget now, and I don't know when it's going to be in the budget, but my children have now termed Mc, uh, McKnight. There's the um, Pawnee side and the Eagleton side. <laughs> and... <laughs> um, so is McKnight even on on the drawing board for the next few years? Because it is pretty pot, it's got a lot of potholes, which you know, right. may be good because it keeps people from going too fast. Traffic but calming. I yeah. don't know. Traffic, <laughs> calming. <laughs> Traffic calming by pothole. But um, is that even on the list for the future? Well, if we get the quote for sealant, they had mentioned that they would saw cut out the worst areas. So like up by the blinking stop sign, you know, the most northern York Drive, they would saw cut out the bad area, put in new hot mix, and then there's a couple other areas, like you mentioned, where the seams come together, you would saw cut out the bad areas, and then put the sealant down. So it would basically match the Ledoux side, and it would have new striping, new uh, marks for the Shero, for the bicycle lanes. Um, we don't know what that is. Hopefully, I can bring it back to you next month and say, well, it's whatever number it is. Say it's $80,000, and how would I pay for it? You know, I don't know what it is. I mean, we're going to find out. They, are taking a little bit longer, but they're also looking at some of our other streets for sealant options. I just wanted to keep proactive and keep these streets sealed because the longer you wait to seal it, you may as well do nothing and let it totally deteriorate and go back to mill and overlay. But usually sealants will buy you about seven years of useful life. Yeah. 
Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think your recommendation is solid, and I, I agree. I wish, just like all things, I wish we had more bids to be able to judge. But at the same time, um, and I, I agree with Alderwoman Tice. I do like the idea of of doing a not just commercial, and I think we should take care of the residents, streets, and some of the commercial ones that that need it the most. Um, as far as the 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 additional money, um, I, I think that's something that I'd like to see more of a plan of what's the best application of that. For example, do we let that kind of carry over and use it for a McKnight, you know, uh, sealant or, or something like that? Um, the other thing that I was thinking of is I noticed it was in here in saying, you know, maybe use some funds for the Howard, uh, Evans Howard Monument. I mean, that's where I'd love to see maybe I'd, I'd like to see the resident streets taken care of um, uh, with as much money as we can. And then, you know, if there's ways that public works department can lay the slab for the monument and save some costs, you know, you know, that, that might be more interesting to, to look at. Um, I know it's not a tremendous amount of money, but every dollar counts. <laughs> All right, does anybody want to make a motion? I'll make the motion to um, approve the recommendation of street projects uh, and forward on to the Board of Aldermen for, for approval. Second. Okay. Any other comments, discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. I'm a nay, so three to one. Okay, thanks Dan. And we'll move into citizen comment. Okay. Uh, seeing no new business, this meeting is adjourned. Thanks. <laughs>